Ideas in STEM Ed is a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center at UC San Diego, which works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. My name is Darren Lapomi, Professor of Nanoengineering and Chemical Engineering and Faculty Director of the Idea Center. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a forum for the discussion of innovative and inclusive approaches to teaching and mentoring, and to support the personal and academic flourishing and success of students in science and engineering. To learn more about the Idea Center, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. Shigong Suo is the Alan E. and Marilyn M. Puckett Professor of Mechanics and Materials in the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Professor Suo obtained his BS degree from Jian Jiao Tan University in 1985 and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Harvard University in 1989. He began his independent career at UC Santa Barbara, moved to Princeton in 1997, and to Harvard in 2003. It was during this period that I became aware of Zhigong's work when he attended some of our more mechanics-oriented group meetings. Zhigong has been a leader in the thermomechanical reliability of semiconductor devices and did some of the first mechanical analyses on soft matter devices critical to haptics, robotics, adhesives, and human-machine interfaces. He is an engaging public speaker and storyteller, and his talks generate standing room-only crowds at conferences. In this episode, we talked about his trajectory and his career and life and challenges facing Asian and Chinese American scientists and engineers. Welcome, Zhigong. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Darren. So tell me a little bit about your interest in mechanics and where it arose from. Uh, interest in mechanics. Uh, interest. So when I, I, I had my uh, high degree, high school degree in, in China, and uh, also my college, uh, attended college in in China as well. So uh, that was, uh, yeah, 81, 1981. Um, so there was a national entrance exam. And then we were supposed, to, after the exam, we were supposed to uh, say what was our um, um, uh, wish, which university, which, uh, which specialty. In China, at that point, the, uh, the disciplines are finally divided. So I didn't know what, what to do. So, so how funny. It could be there will be 30, 60 people at a university specialized in welding. Uh, and another 30, 60 people specialized in refrigeration. So mm -hmm. I had no clue I could commit to to these things. <laughs> Very specific topics. Very specific. I was told it was uh, influenced by Russian system. I don't know these things myself. So, but my parents both were uh, college uh, uh, lecturers at that time. Uh, they they taught um, English. They didn't know anything about uh, refrigeration or <laughs> welding or <laughs> such things. They couldn't really advise me. They, they, they took me to my father, took me to somebody who had knowledge of the university, the same university my parents working. And uh, this guy said, oh, I knew uh, you, you were good with uh, mathematics, but uh, China is building up. We don't need that many mathematicians. And our university is not that good with mathematics. How about mechanics? I, was, I already studied mechanics in high school. Why should I study mechanics again? Oh, no, no, no. This mechanics is different. Mm -hmm. This is about uh, building bridges, uh, building airplanes. Um, so I thought it, it, it could be fine. That's, so at that time, I only, uh, my only good subject was mathematics. So. That we, that, 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 that's, that was it, because the universe yeah, required us after 18 years old time, declare a specific major. Mm -hmm. And the mechanics was the only thing kind of related to me. So that was it. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. So when 
Professor John Hutchinson uh, toured, went on a, a long tour of China and ended up in your town at your university. You had a meeting with him and this meeting changed your, uh, your career trajectory. Um, you did your PhD at Harvard um, and eventually became an assistant professor at Santa Barbara um, and then went to Princeton. Now, this is sort of where our uh, our intellectual histories intersect, because you had a senior colleague, uh, Sigurd Wagner, who was uh, who is an electrical engineer and uh, came to you with a problem on large area electronics, flexible electronics, and uh, and studying thermomechanical behavior of of interfaces, and uh, and I wonder. How is it? How, how did you think about this uh, this transition from mechanics of hard materials to mechanics of soft materials? Was it a big jump for you, or was it a, a fairly simple, you know, um, a transition? Yeah, well, that was uh, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, so when I was uh, uh, at uh, UC Santa Barbara before Princeton. That was my UC Santa Barbara was my first uh, uh, academic position. So there was a huge activity there on ceramic matrix composite. So that's a terrific idea. So uh, these are engine, uh, airplane engines. The idea are, is uh, to use a higher and a higher temperature so you can do a few efficiency and uh, you can also burn things uh, more completely, maybe environmentally sound. That was a time that was in late 80, early 90. So there was a terrific guy. I don't know if you know this, uh, heard of this uh, person, Tony Evans. He was a leader at Santa Barbara, intellectual leader. Very charismatic Welsh. Very charismatic. Anyway, he got us all together to study ceramic matrix composite. So my role was to do mechanics analysis. Uh, ceramic matrix is a terrific idea. Ceramic can sustain high temperature, but it was too brittle. So nobody would think it was a good idea to use ceramics to make engines. But around that time, even before that, clever people thought about it. So they said, uh, two ceramics can be, all ceramics are brittle, but if you combine two together, somehow it become ductile. It can be as ductile as steel. It was terrific. So I was, uh, it was not my idea, not even Tony Evans' idea, but uh, it was a serious development he was leading. I was doing mathematical mechanics analysis of these uh, experiments uh, materials. So that was, uh, oh, uh, around that time, uh, there was also um, a, a friend who joined Intel as engineer. So that was early 90s. And he discovered that he had a material science background from MIT, was a postdoc at uh, UC Santa Barbara. We, we got to be a good friend. So. Then he joined Intel. He noticed at Intel, people were developing structures at a much smaller scale, not bridges, not airplanes, but much smaller. Mm -hmm. And these people, engineers, remarkable engineers, they're doing things by trial and error was somehow fine, but it uh, doesn't seem to be uh, uh, sustainable. It's a very, uh, yeah, uh, so he decided he wanted, and his friends, or colleagues, wanted to introduce some some aerospace thinking into designing small structure. So big structures are uh, right designed for mechanical reliability, experiment designed, and small structure were not designed for reliability, just for function. Right, you need to be mm -hmm. a transistor. If uh, especially when you make a transistor, you have a multiple materials together. Um, and uh, during fabrication, you have a very high temperature, 500 degrees C, 
and then room temperature, many materials, uh, um, there's a contract, heat, con thermal contraction, expansion, cause a lot of residual stress. Also, if you have seen these uh, structures um, on a microscope, these are just uh, really almost like a civil engineering structure, bridges, uh, 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 yeah, intricate structures, different materials. So reliability is a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. It's a very serious issue. So, and uh, I got yeah, he got me involved yeah, involved in this kind of a uh, uh, microelectronic uh, structure mechanics problem. Again, while I was doing analysis in mechanics, um, so that's a condition when I went to Princeton. So. Sieger Wagner, just a terrific guy. Um, he and I were, he was in uh, 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 yeah, electrical engineering. I was in mechanical and aerospace. But uh, at Princeton, uh, we have a special arrangement. So uh, my office and his office are very nearby on the same floor by coincidence. Mm -hmm. He was an early riser. I was early riser. So seven o'clock in the morning, he often came to my office to describe his problem. You know, what, what, what are you doing, Shigang? I heard I was very proud of his electrical engineering. I told him, I collaborate with Intel. Mm -hmm. He immediately laughed at me. <laughs> I don't, why, why do you want to work with Intel? This is an old industry. We're at Princeton. We need to create a new industry. Instead of doing microelectronics, we should do macroelectronics, big. <laughs> so we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Electronics get smaller, but people don't get smaller. People need to have large monitors, uh, displays. That's what we're doing. <laughs> that was, uh, so he was pushing, initially, literally pushing large screen displays macro ma macro uh electronics so that's how i got involved he uh uh yeah Seeger was a really an intellectual leader in many ways he not influenced influenced me and influenced a number of other colleagues mm -hmm. and he also organized some national meeting went to darpa we all went to darpa uh at darpa meeting i actually met two to future leaders, uh, John Rogers, mm -hmm. and uh, and your uh, post advisor, um, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, 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 yeah. uh, Jenan Bao. Yeah, Jenan Bao. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Before that, I didn't know them. So we are, we were talking about uh, so the title of uh, the workshop, cooked up by. Um, uh, Seeger and uh, his, his daughter friend. It's called sensitive skins. So that was the beginning of uh, electronic e schemes. Well, I learned things uh, from him. You ask whether it's a easy transition or not. Uh, initially, it wasn't too difficult uh, because initially we were just uh, doing so one project was just doing a curve, the surface, put a transistor on the curved surface. So because it's a curve, so you can do camera image a little better. So it mimic, I guess, eye a little better. Uh, so so the material is a, is a plastics, and uh, then you just uh, somehow make curve and put transistor on, on top of that we figure out a way actually publish a paper how, how you do that so um initially it wasn't too hard uh, for, for doing mechanics the difficulty really came in when seeger want to do stretchable yeah yeah and this is also where uh, interfacial mechanics and material science and particularly soft organic material science have a very uh, fruitful intersection yeah. Yeah. and i've i've noticed uh, that your work has become decidedly more 
molecular uh, closer to the uh, to the chemistry um, in recent years um, is that a deliberate choice or a, a choice out of necessity or is that where the interesting problems uh, arose uh, so now at Princeton I still limit uh, my whole group was doing uh, computation mechanics analysis so I le learned with Seeger a little bit about uh, how elastomer work. I didn't know I actually knew anything about uh, hydrogels at that time. It wasn't even in the vocabulary mm -hmm. of a Seeger. <laughs> so, um, and then I had this opportunity to, to return to Harvard as a faculty. Uh, so then uh, it has something to do with your advisor, uh, George Whitesides. So uh, a Princeton colleague, um, uh, Johan Axe, uh, chemical engineer, material scientist, uh, he and I had been collaborating when I was at Princeton. I moved to Harvard. We continue to collaborate. Uh, Johan has a uh, had very good uh, yeah, collaboration with uh, George Whitesides. So he brought me and uh, George together. Three of us and other people wrote a Murray uh, proposal, got funded. So for that project, we were supposed to do stretchable electrodes. I happen to know quite a bit about electroactive materials, starting with the piezoelectric ceramics. So I knew something about electrodes, but it was George. George's mind is such a fluid. So the moment he recognized what is electrodes, everything become electrodes. <laughs> as long as your charge somehow is separated, liquid become electrodes, polymer become everything is electrodes. Okay, I need to do something about the, uh, something electrical. So that was fine with me. I had previous experience with a uh, uh, piezoelectric ceramics. Mm -hmm. when I was uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, so I, I decided to, um, uh, yeah, I was looking for projects, uh, what to do. Um, uh, so then uh, around that time, one thing leads to another, uh, we started to uh, look at uh, dielectric elastomer. You probably know something about it. Uh, so these are just a regular dielectric insulating uh, rubber-like material. So, mm -hmm. um, and the way you apply voltage is the insulator as a capacitor. So positive electrode, negative electrode, uh, they attract each other, squeeze the material, and the material area become larger. So that is a uh, actuation, change voltage to a deformation. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a soft material, deformation can be very large. So I uh, so begin to do uh, these uh, uh, electroactive uh, uh, soft material. Uh, and then, uh, so at Harvard, um, so we have a very, uh, so on the same floor, just a few offices down, David Mooney is uh, a um, bioengineer. He is a world leading expert on hydrogels. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, we started to do hydrogel. At that time, there was a terrific student in my group, um, uh, Xuan He, Zhao. You probably know him mm -hmm. now. Of course, uh, yeah. Extraordinarily successful uh, professor at MIT. Uh, so, and he uh, led the initial interaction interaction with uh, with uh, David Mooney's group. Mm -hmm. So at Harvard, we're so collaborative. So all uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Shanghe need to propose. You know, oh, I can spend one semester to take reading course with uh, uh, David Mooney. And David Mooney can say yes or can say no. But David said yes. 
So mm-hmm. <laughs> then, then uh, yeah, at that time, uh, Xuan Ke, uh, all his background, he was an electrical engineer at undergraduate level and a material computational person as a master from a Canadian place, came to Harvard just as a theoretical person. No background in soft material, yeah. no background in in uh, experiments. And then just because this this, uh, this opportunity, we have a funding through George's, uh, George Whiteside's uh, <laughs> Uh, electrons, everything electrons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, we initially uh, published uh, a few papers, just of mechanics about alginate, how this uh, seaweed derived uh, hydrogel, uh, how mechanical, uh, uh, that material mechanical behavior. Uh, people knew something, but uh, we felt we can make some contribution. Publish a few papers. Uh, one thing leads from another. Uh, uh, we develop this uh, version of uh, tough hydrogen uh, mm-hmm. that led to a paper in Nature. That was a very big uh, breakthrough for our group. All the experiments were done uh, at the David Mooney's uh, lab. I had mm. no lab at that point. So, but uh, uh, Xuan He got a few other people in my group interested. So these were all, actually there was a, a Korean um, uh, visiting student, later become postdoc, Jen Yong Sang. Sure, I know. He, he was Yeah. He, he was actually a visiting uh, scholar in my lab last year until the pandemic uh, cut his visit short. <laughs> Oh, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was uh, very creative, very creative. At that time, he was a visiting student at Harvard. Later on, uh, became a postdoc. So he stayed at Harvard. I don't know how many years. Quite a number of years, four, five, six years. I forgot. Mm-hmm. So, and he, uh, Jian Yong Sang, became a leader of that project. But the initial material, initial concept was really. Uh, conceived uh, by Xuan mm-hmm. uh, So, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, we create a first version uh, because uh, the intimate involvement of this project, uh, these uh, young people really taught me how to think about uh, um, the behavior, mechanical behavior in terms of the uh, molecules hydrogel polymer and another uh, polyacrylamide. Um, so now uh, my own field, starting from PhD time, really was a uh, fracture mechanics, how fracture work initially in metals, then in ceramics, then in composites, and then in stretchable electronics. But the way we th- think about these uh, fracture it's always uh, from atomic point of view. For example, for metal, because a fracture ultimately involves breaking atomic bonds mm-hmm. and also flowing things. So that wasn't hard. Thinking about it atomically, at molecular level, but uh, the new dimension is uh, instead of just uh, thinking about and uh, computing it, I had to translate that thinking into something you can make. Mm-hmm. That's a new constraint. Yeah, that's how it started. Sure. Uh, so your your work is very fundamental. Uh, yet you and you and you, but your degrees are in engineering. You have taught in engineering departments. Do you consider yourself a scientist or an engineer, or is the distinction not useful, as George Whitesides would say? <laughs> George Whitesides, yeah, George is probably the world's most famous engineer. <laughs> 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 With no degrees in engineering. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, I have a huge admirer, uh, fan of George's approach. It was quite natural uh, for me the moment I uh, got a chance to really inter- interact with him uh, quite extensively. Of course, he has many, many people interacting with him uh, 
extensively. So, um, yeah, uh, the distinction I think is a real uh, scientist and uh, engineer. Uh, so it, my understanding is, uh, I guess, the the fundamental role of a scientist really is to understand nature. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, fundamental uh, uh, role of engineer is to create something nature doesn't have. Uh, so that role, I think, is real. This distinction is real. But for individual, it's hard to make that distinction. Once you understand <laughs> a little bit of nature and you see something missing that can help people, you start to create. Sure. Uh, so often our work, it's also genuine. There's some have something about uh, about inspiration. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes that inspiration is a little fake, but often I think it's a genuine because you have to almost have to see things are uh, in action. That's a stimulation, and yeah. Uh, yeah, the natural world provides so many examples of unusual, interesting that provide you way to think about things. I often get in trouble with chemists when I say that organic chemistry is a philosophically engineering uh, <laughs> because at the end of the day, you need to put something in a bottle <laughs> or on a windshield or on nail polish or on laminate flooring. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. You talked a bit about some international students who and visiting scholars that you've had in your lab. Um, you yourself were an international student. Um, and the bravery of my international students never ceases to impress me, um, especially with regard to language comprehension, coming to a new country for the first time, um, especially language comprehension in a highly technical Area. So I'd like to first ask you, um, how did you manage at Harvard when you fir in your first semester um, as a new English learner? Wow. Yeah, uh, I cannot remember. Oh, no, I cannot forget. Sorry. <laughs> because uh, this uh, just burned into the brain, the humility. Uh, so I, now my parents, um, they were both uh, English. Uh, they taught English uh, on uh, in, in my own college in China, but they themselves learned English when they were adults. So because they were originally uh, trained to teach Russian, yeah, during Cultural Revolution, wow. suddenly Russian became uh, not useful. So they actually both learned English in their late thirties. Wow, a uh, as I can attest, not a not an easy time to learn a new language. <laughs> right. So I didn't appreciate that. Right. So, but they muddled through both. Uh, uh, I guess at that time, not many people had the skill anyway. They had to do it as a literally. They learn English in the morning and they begin to teach in the afternoon or something like this. Well, one semester they learn English, next semester they have to teach. So that, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a still during cultural revolution. Very interesting time. <clears throat> so they did that. They never managed to make me interested in English as a language. Uh, so I was muddling through. But uh, at that time, uh, because there's a terrific man in China, Deng Xiaoping, you probably heard this man, mm -hmm. he had a very simple vision for China, uh, need to lift people out of poverty. Uh, you can eat and you can, uh, you can wear things. So not, not wealthy, but, but can live a normal life. So that was in 70s, 80s, he had this dream. And his goal is by 2000, most Chinese people could do that. Mm -hmm. That was his stated goal. And he accomplished that eventually. Anyway, so then even by that time, I was in high school in 70s. Our cultural revolution ended in 1976. And immediately, country, almost overnight, the country started, oh, we're going to need engineers. We're going to build the country. So uh, <clears throat> I guess there was a, 
always understanding China was maybe 50 years behind the advanced world. I don't know where people came out. There's a 50 years, five zero. Um, and, and then what we need to do it in 2000, not to reach that level of advancement, but at least make people uh, live reasonably well. <clears throat> so engineers. And uh, therefore, our, we need to learn from a Western world and uh, we need to study English. So I think I start, started to learn English this is a mandatory um, in uh, high school. Mm -hmm. But uh, my parents were never interested enough or interest, made enough effort to interest me so that they could give me special lessons. So my English was okay in, in high school, muddled through. But in college, it was an immediate career. English was the most important skill that mm -hmm. young men and young women need to have. Why? So good young men and young women need to go to America or go to Europe. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I just spend, uh, I think, the half of my time studying time studying English when I was in college. Um, so that yeah, mostly through reading. So our professors uh, were all um, native Chinese. They couldn't really speak very well. So their way of instruction is through grammar mm -hmm. and through uh, reading and writing. So when by the time uh, this so I passed an examination, got to the United States, uh, examining uh, total score was uh, pretty high. I've forgotten the number, but, but it was high. <clears throat> uh, but uh, uh, then when I came to this country, uh, I could read, I could write very well. Uh, I guess by Chinese standard. Uh, Hutchinson said I could write well, but he still corrects <laughs> me saying Well, well. that's high praise. <laughs> 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 so my advisor. Anyway, uh, but uh, the difficulty is uh, was uh, speaking. It was a difficult, but the most difficult was uh, listening. Mm -hmm. Listening, you couldn't control the speed. Uh, in class, I couldn't understand things. So uh, there was a course taught by Professor Spartan. He's a dear colleague now. Yeah, I know him. <laughs> yeah, he was a young man from Europe, Belgium, had thick European accent. I could hardly understand him. Also, his course is so deep and broad in material science. I had no background. In class, I couldn't understand him at all. I had to read. He didn't have a textbook. I had a, a stack of textbook, uh, just uh, looking for hints, things. Uh, he kind of talked about similar figures. It was very, very hard. So what can we do as instructors to make it easier for international students to learn from us? Oh, uh, I think English uh, level now has improved, I believe. Um, so today students uh, came with a better skill in listening and uh, listening comprehension and uh, speaking better than I had. They probably couldn't write as well I, I, I did, but uh, they, they improved. So I didn't notice uh, a serious difficulty mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, with uh, yeah, foreign students, uh, Koreans and uh, and uh, the Chinese couldn't notice difference. Mm -hmm. Also, Iranian, no, no. So, I I don't know. Uh, I don't believe it's still a huge barrier, at least from instruction. Yeah, the that's. That's great. Uh, that's great to see because international students are the uh, lifeblood of our graduate programs, and um, and it, it leads me into the next uh, topic, which is uh, the 
Justice Department. And I don't know how much uh, we want to go on the record here, uh, but I wonder if you have any comments as to what the Justice Department gets wrong about the way science is done in the United States. Oh, uh, this is a huge topic. Uh, I don't know how much you follow this uh, uh, development development yourself, Professor Charlie Lieber, right? From mm -hmm. your own old department, Charlie Lieber. Yeah. yeah. Nobody could dream he would be connected with the espionage. Yeah. Right? Charlie Lieber, espionage. How ridiculous that could be. Uh, now he probably was the most famous case of this China initiative uh, started by Justice Department uh, 2018. How much do you follow these cases at all? I I know quite a bit. I think I know more than I know more than the median academic. Um, I have a special interest in it because one time um so let me back up occasionally we get emails on campus from the uh, office of export controls and legal counsel that tell us that if um, a representative of a government agency comes to the door uh, to not talk to them but to call the uh, the appropriate campus uh, representative and um, i think i i had forgotten that instruction at the time um, because uh, some people came to the door and uh, and were I was in a meeting at the time but you know if they flash the badge you have to do what they say right or so I thought um, because it seemed to me that my uh, that if I got on the phone and called legal counsel it'll look like I, ha I had done something wrong <laughs> And this must happen all the time uh, because, you know, it couldn't have just been me, right? I mean, I don't do any classified research. Um, I have uh, grants from the DOD, but it's all unclassified. The, the work, we want to publish it. Um, and moreover, the NIH and NSF have mandatory open access policies. So your, your work must be made available on, on PubMed or the NSF equivalent 12 months after the uh, publication of the article. So it seems to me that there is a disconnect in the, the way that research funding is administered and this, um, uh, you know these these accusations of um, of espionage and uh, foreign dissemination of research of, of of publicly funded research results that are not classified. I mean, what is the point of a scientific paper, right? If not to to disseminate the information as widely as possible. So. Um, you know, at the time, I, I felt uh, a little bit humiliated by my, uh, you know, uh, my my response, which is, you know, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. I'll be good, sir. I will not let my leave my laptop unattended when traveling internationally. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, that was good enough for them. Um, and it was very cryptic, uh, very it was bullying um and uh and it my, i think my you know i replay scenarios in my head where i'm in a meeting with a student and even after they flash the badge i tell them <laughs> i'm in a meeting can you wait <laughs> i should have said that right but you know uh <laughs> I, I thought i was in trouble yeah yeah so now, so I guess uh, there, uh, I don't really know, I guess uh, these things uh, never understand. Uh, so for all these years, uh, I guess uh, in my, uh, so I came to this country, just to use my own, my, myself as an example, came to this country in 86. The first time I actually went back to China, it's 2000. 14 years after. So um, then in subsequent years uh, are initially maybe are once every other year, I would go back because my parents still there. 
they could visit, but they got old. I need to see them. So, and China probably, uh, yeah, just around that time uh, became, uh, they're doing very well. They became heavily uh, uh, funding um, scientific research. That was new around, around that time it all began. So, uh, so then I became, you know, went back maybe every year. So, uh, so each time, of course, people ask me to give a talk, right? But not once there is even a hint that you do some uh, spying. I guess uh, these people probably intelligent enough to know I have no unusual information to, to, to really give to them. It's just publish information, teach them what we publish, uh, explain, yeah, give just a usual scientific talk. So, and then uh, because my parents uh, get older and older, so it almost, I have to go back once a year. So then my hosts, they're, uh, they're ha- tired of uh, um, uh, just each time uh, arrange uh, your accommodation. Uh, why don't we give you a, a, a ongoing visiting uh, you know, appointment? Uh, sure. So, right, that, that, was, that was it. Never crossing my mind this kind of thing could be potential problem. But in hindsight, of course it could be. But I guess uh, the White House, uh, from White House recently, mm-hmm. Eric Lander said it very clearly that in future, uh, the United States need to have uh, very clear rules for disclosure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the past uh, at Harvard, you know this, yeah. anytime uh, if you're, uh, you receive money more than 5,000, you need to disclose. I make sure I do that, right? If anybody invite me to have a dinner, do I disclose that? If I start to make make notes for that, I, I won't have time to do the real things yeah. anymore, right? Yeah. So I, but right yeah. now uh, the disclosure yeah. rule just recently, even at Harvard, has changed. It's almost anything in kind, even without any money, you need yeah. to disclose. So then. I think the scope become a very different from before. A B uh, that create huge possibility of making mistakes. How do you think that this uh, attitude of the government has affected the climate of uh, for our Chinese American and international students from China and researchers of Chinese origin in general? Well, it sent. Uh, the, in the field, it's called a chilling effect. Mm-hmm. It's genuine. It's a uh, genuine. So the concrete thing is a uh, number of things. Are, uh, so we have recently started a new organization called Asian American Scholars uh, Forum. Mm-hmm. So initially, just organize uh, webinars to educate uh, scholars, uh, also try to engage uh, people from government, DOJ, and engage people from university to see there must be some misunderstanding here because none of us searching our heart had any experience closely related to espionage. Sure, of course. We don't have that experience, so we cannot really talk about it. But there is something clear misunderstanding. Our colleagues, close colleagues, gets charged, indicted. What mm-hmm. is going on? So the educational active cannot be just on us. DOJ need to learn something. So writing a uh, recommendation letter for any student is a, almost a job requirement. We have to do it. Mm-hmm. That should not be part of the indictment. Yeah. So if you read Gong Chen's part of one entry, is Gong Chen actually wrote letter of recommendation for people apply job in China. How absurd. Yeah, that is absolutely right? reprehensible. Yeah, too low. Either too arrogant to learn or too hideous to, to make up things a fool people who don't understand 
just, 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 I don't know which is which. Either way, it's not very good. Yeah. There, yeah. There's a lot of language we use in academia, even by well-meaning people, yeah. for uh, that that are harmful, you know, to our case of inclusion. And one of those words that's recently started to make me bristle is the word cash cow to describe the relationship of international students to um, especially public universities because they pay full tuition in master's programs. They pay full tuition. They're generally not supported by federal grants. And a large portion of the tuition budget comes from international students. Yet the, the critique on, you know, among faculty members, um, you know, democratic voting, liberal leaning faculty members is to say that international students are a cash cow where the target of that derision is supposed to be the administration, but the actual recipient of that denigration is the student themselves and i just i i hear that word now and and it makes my head explode like we are not creating allies using this language and um i guess that's not a question more of a <laughs> of a, yeah. of a soapbox but yeah 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 i heard a phrase like this uh, myself uh, but recently i seem to be quite interesting um recently there was a concern whether uh in particular chinese students uh, can still uh, come to this country get still can get visa so far seem to be good in general in terms of big numbers their individuals get denied for special cir circumstances so that seemed to be coming back but uh, look uh, this, uh, what the new phrase is the research security. That's something really way above my knowledge about things. I don't know how much you, so essentially, okay, you get, uh, you do research, get government money, some money from uh, defense or energy, uh, presumably can pr produce value. And uh, you publish it, that's fine. But uh, then people say, you also train students. These students, if they're Chinese or, 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 or Korean, they are going back to their country. That's a fact too. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no doubt that as a rapid uh, uh, development in Asia enormously benefited from the education they received from uh, America. I guess sure. We Americans used to be proud of this fact. We lived a lot of people out of poverty. Absolutely. By educating them. But Jigong, you and I have to be careful about what we say publicly here because if the uh, if certain voters or certain members of Congress knew what fraction of the seven billion dollar NSF budget or thirty billion dollar NIH budget went to the training of international graduate students and postdocs, they would be taken aback, and we may, uh, <laughs> you know, we uh, less enlightened administrations may wish to uh, curtail that funding or place certain restrictions restrictions on whom can be trained using those resources. Um, and that's something that has always uh, that has always scared me. Yeah, it scares me also. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, you probably always pay attention to all kinds of things. Just uh, knowing what, what I know about you. I was uh, not very politically uh, uh, sensitive about things that wasn't very interested until gun chancellor arrest, right? Uh, your politics mm -hmm. is not my thing. Many people in my generation of Chinese descent, it's kind of like that. So we just left China because we really dislike politics of all kinds. Just uh, let us do our own things, uh, spend time with the family and books. We were very happy. So, but nonetheless, I actually, there's a debate you know, uh, you know, between parties, uh, I, I must say, I, I can see points from both ends, right? Uh, research security, and it is also a fact uh, that uh, America, American education or Western education, there is a massive uh, 
technolo technological transfer from textbooks, from uh, attending schools, not by espionage. Espionage must be minute among yeah. by real wealth. I don't have statistics, but if anybody disagree with that statement, they need to show numbers. Yeah, ninety nine percent of the <laughs> sure, <laughs> the vast majority of of knowledge transfer is via legitimate means, and uh, and and government funding paid for a lot of most of the legitimate, <laughs> or or much of the legitimate transfer as well in terms of, of yeah. So in one side of uh, the, um, in one side of the argument, I can see that the science is noble liberate people right you teach people how to fish rather than you know always cook fish and send to them that seemed to be a very good strategy right I have a stable country a large country make that country chaotic probably it's not to anybody's interest anyway so that's one kind of argument the other kind of argument hey the year is a right uh, national security and uh, they are doing so so well and they don't follow rules that also has a lot of element of truth in that i actually don't know at high level at the end i felt it has to be a political decision cannot mm -hmm. right cannot do massive experiment let's do experiments see both ways you, you cannot do that you only have yeah. one world come on political decision so i'm all for that debate uh, heartfelt honest debate that's fine but what's wrong with this DOJ uh, 2018 rule? They are changing the rules in the middle and making up rules and then punish people who were totally innocent in the old way of doing science. It's very open. You collaborate with whoever who can collaborate with you. Yeah. Yeah. Has, even in the charges themselves has no mention of espionage. The legal document has zero mention of it's always a disclosure. Have you disclosed this tie with China or not? Sure. That's totally different things. So espionage and the disclosure, these are two different things. But the way government, DOJ, FBI announces these cases, you can look at their, their uh, for example, Twitter account. It's just hideous. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. We only have yeah. about two minutes left, so, but I wanted to end on a uh, what I think is a positive note. Um, the field of soft materials, flexible electronics, and soft robotics is very nice. The people in it are supportive. That's my impression. And sometimes I feel like I got away easy in my scientific career by being part of such a supportive field and i i um i look at other fields and there are partisans there are people who shout at conferences at each other and i wonder if there's some characteristic of soft matter flexible electronics soft robotics these areas we work in that uh that are especially uh, amenable and welcoming to that make the field especially welcoming to uh to newcomers and new ideas i wonder if you have a reaction to that or if if you think yeah, it's true yeah, yeah yeah that is uh i think that's true partly i think it's because uh, the field is relatively young and uh the yeah so there are even the most successful people are very young are uh, so um, also very interdisciplinary, right? So you're a chemist by training, I'm a mechanical engineer. I really knew you have a deep knowledge in areas that uh, I had no clue. So that bring in a lot of collaborations that bring uh, respect. Also mechanics, uh, I have a knowledge seem to be totally trivial for me. But then Sigurd Water was totally delighted that <laughs> there was such a field of knowledge existed. So that was a uh, very delightful. That actually we got off, uh, yeah, from a very uh, good uh, start and uh, a few extraordinary individuals that helped us uh, start it. 
Well, that is a wonderful note to end on. And thank you very much, Shikang, for your time. This is a great conversation, and I know our audience will appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Darren. Thanks for listening to Ideas in STEM Ed, a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. This episode was edited and engineered by Sky Lee with theme music written and performed by John Viviani. Title art was created by Caitlin Wong. Special thanks to Sarah Eckerd for guest booking and marketing. The Idea Center works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. To reach us for guest suggestions and other feedback, please send an email to ideadirector at eng.ucsd.edu. And to learn more about our programs, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. As a final note, the views expressed by me or the guests do not necessarily reflect those of the Idea Center, the Jacobs School of Engineering, or UC San Diego. See you next time.